AI and machine learning are directly applicable to the surveillance and monitoring in response to coronavirus. Attracted a lot of attention for the work that is done for the U.S. government, including the CIA. And Isn't it just about making it easier for all those third parties to get hold of your data? Arguably, another way of privatizing the NHS. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching The Listening Post, working from home. Here are the coronavirus stories, the media elements that we're looking at this week. The British government gets some outside help from technology companies to take on COVID-19. But where will all the health data, the personal medical records, end up? Different news anchors, identical content. Amazon delivers a PR video and local American newscasts just roll over and run it. Science reporters have proven their value in covering the pandemic, but they're also taking some heat. And with so much of the world stuck on pause, we'll fast forward to the day. And so when we found the cure and were allowed to go outside. The coronavirus story can be told in retrospect. Put yourself in the shoes of the NHS, the UK's taxpayer funded public health service. You treat around a million patients every 36 hours, and that's pre pandemic. The amount of health data you're now churning out is enormous and you want to harness that data in the fight against COVID-19. So you turn to the private sector and get technology companies to help you do that. Seems to make sense, but here's the issue. Companies with checkered histories over data handling start landing those contracts. And to date, the British government has refused to disclose the contractual terms. Information does not get any more personal than your health data. And in the midst of this pandemic, the British public has been left in the dark on where that data is going and what these companies and the government might be able to do with it down the road. Our starting point this week is London. This pandemic has attacked populations and the response in country after country has amounted to an assault on privacy. The methods the authorities, aided by big tech companies, have put in place follow our movements, who we meet. The privacy story unfolding in the UK is on another level. It's about all the new health data produced by COVID-19, the caseloads, transmission rates, the testing, combined with the medical records the NHS, the National Health Service, already has on its servers, such as underlying conditions, demographics. It's a giant gold mine of data that when aggregated and deciphered could help the NHS better direct its resources, hone its treatments and save lives. The core issues are who gets access to that health data and what will they do with it? Because this goes beyond mere contact tracing and where people have been. It hits much closer to home. Let's be very clear. Your medical record is like a fingerprint. The sort of data that's in it, detailed linked data about an individual's health or events in their life, they're all inherently identifying. Those linked events can pick you out from any aggregation of data. So the data's not and will never truly be anonymous. So your full health record goes, quote unquote, on the record somewhere, is stored. In 10 years time, um, there is new research that says if you have contracted COVID-19, you have a 75 whatever uh, percent chance of uh, getting lung cancer. A model could be built based on that that calculates risk for insurance companies. So that could later down the line affect uh, whether or not you get insurance or how much you pay for insurance, right? So what will happen with that raw data uh, in the future? That is unclear, and it doesn't help that the UK's Department of Health has already changed its story. On March 28th, it assured Britons their health data would remain anonymous. Later, it backtracked, saying that when that data is shared, privacy protection regulations will be followed, an implicit admission that it cannot guarantee a patient's anonymity. That raised alarms, as did the government's choice of private sector partners to analyze that data. It's hired a company called Faculty, a British tech firm that worked for the Leave side in the Brexit referendum and has since landed multiple contracts with Boris Johnson's government. And then there's the American data analytics company, Palantir, whose founder is a libertarian Donald Trump supporter who has said he does not believe freedom and democracy are compatible. 
The name, Palantir, is a Lord of the Rings reference to a crystal ball that can see into the future and the past. The company was was founded by a, 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 a Silicon Valley entrepreneur called Peter Thiel. Um, he was one of the founders of, of PayPal. And Palantir, ever since its formation, has been controversial, partly because one of its initial uh, investors was the venture capital arm of the, the, of the CIA. So you know, that's always going to put people on alert when an organization like the CIA is investing in a, in a technology company. Palantir are not really a medical firm. They're a data mining firm that cut their teeth assisting the CIA in Iraq and Afghanistan. Last year, they became pretty famous for providing data support to immigration and customs enforcement in the United States and their brutal regime of deportations. Now that there is a global health crisis, there's more money in public health, and the company has decided to pivot. And the question is whether a firm whose bread and butter for years and years was to get involved in the counterinsurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan and the terrible human rights abuses uh, at the U.S. border, uh, whether that's really the kind of business you want uh, as a partner with your most treasured asset, your, your national health system. The answer to that question could well lie in what those companies are doing for the NHS, the contractual terms and conditions. But no one in the government is willing to reveal them. FOIs, Freedom of Information Requests, filed by news organizations and activist groups, have been ignored and the office that is supposed to oversee the FOI process and enforce that law says the government can take its time responding, given that it's so busy these days. Fox Club, my organization, put in a Freedom of Information Act request more than six weeks ago for this material, uh, and we've been told not that we can have it, not even that it's coming, but that the government wants to balance the public's right to know what's going on against the business interests of these companies. There's not anything like enough transparency, and that's not anything to do with the pandemic or the speed at which they had to move initially. We're not saying that data should not be used. All data will be handled according to the highest ethical and security standards. We're not saying that they should fire this company or that necessarily, but when they start to gather, process and analyse everyone's data, we need to know exactly what is going on. What has been reported is that Palantir is hiring out some of its data specialists to the NHS for about one dollar per day. Is that big tech sacrificing for the greater good? Consider it more of an investment, a company positioning itself. White House documents revealed last year that the Trump administration was in trade talks with the Johnson government and that NHS data was on the table. The UK's coronavirus response appears to have accelerated that process. And once those tech companies are in the door and have access to NHS servers, it will be difficult to get them back out because of what's known as vendor lock-in. What it's traditionally meant is that uh, a government becomes so dependent upon technology suppliers that use proprietary technologies um, that no other companies can, can supply that it becomes almost impossible for them to use anybody else. So every time you want to um, buy new technologies, expand what you've got, you're left with no choice but to always go back to that, that, that same company. The reason why this is problematic, uh, you know, aside from the fact that you only have one vendor you have to work with, is that this vendor becomes infrastructural in the sense that a private company provides public infrastructure um, and there is no um, sort of uh, democratic oversight. The new contemporary economy is run on the idea that uh, people's data is a source of money, right? That's what these companies exist to do. They're not nonprofits. They're not helping people out out of the goodness of their hearts. And so if the NHS is Britain's most beloved public asset, and if Arguably, the health data is the single greatest source of untapped value to the NHS. If we're going to suddenly let data miners get access to that data, we have got to see the terms on which those companies have access, that they are not going to be able to exploit it for, for unfair gain in ways that none of us ever agreed to. And it's not just the NHS and the United States health systems. Palantir, faculty, and companies like them are offering their data services to countries around the world. 
Initially, the techniques they developed, the models they built, were used by everyone from intelligence agencies to politicians to advertisers. In the fight against the virus, they've been utilized to track our movements, our interactions, our current state of health. And now that our medical records are in the mix, it's getting personal. The technology better work because the price, if you value your privacy, is steep. We're discussing other media stories, coronavirus-related, with one of our producers now, Johanna Hoos. Joe, local TV stations in the U.S. have been filing stories on the world's largest retailer, Amazon, and its handling of COVID-19 in the workplace. Those pieces have been spookily similar. What is the backstory here? Well, they had a little help, Richards. At least 11 local news organizations aired segments on Amazon's health and safety procedures during the pandemic. And the company has faced a lot of scrutiny over its failure to protect its employees. Um, so this is a legitimate news story, but the scripts and the talking points were pretty identical. Millions of Americans staying at home are relying on Amazon. Millions of Americans staying at home are relying on Amazon. Millions of Americans staying at home are relying on Amazon. Millions of Americans staying at home are relying on Amazon. The company is keeping employees safe and healthy. The company is keeping its employees safe and healthy. Turns out that it was actually Amazon's PR department who didn't just provide the video, but actually wrote the scripts, a fact that a lot of these anchors failed to mention. So this was a bit of free PR for Amazon, PR that it could really use as at least eight of its employees are reported to have died as a result of the virus. And a lot of Amazon personnel have complained not just about working conditions, but about the fact that the company attempts to silence those who choose to speak out. Let's move on to Brazil, second only to the US now, Joe, in the number of coronavirus infections. And some of the major media players there have announced that they are suspending their reporting from outside the office of the president in the middle of a health crisis. So who's involved and what happened? Well, they are some of uh, Brazil's major news outlets, including uh, broadcaster Globo and Folha de Sao Paulo, a leading newspaper there. And they say that the issue is one of security, that uh, supporters of President Jair Bolsonaro are getting out of hand. Now, Bolsonaro has waged a war of words against the media ever since coming into office. And recently, the coverage hasn't exactly been kind. But what do you expect? We're talking about a president who has called this virus just a little flu, who has actually criticized or mocked reporters for wearing masks, whilst the death toll keeps climbing. Now, following months of harassment by hardcore Bolsonaro supporters who have called reporters uh, scum and rats and sellout media, they are now saying that they no longer feel safe and that their cameras will no longer be rolling outside the president's office. Now, this is like um, reporters in the UK saying that they will no longer show up outside 10 Downing Street. But how long will they hold out, considering that Jair Bolsonaro is such a big part of the COVID-19 story in Brazil? Okay, thanks, Joe. For months now, journalists around the world have been on a crash course in reporting on medical science. They had little or no experience in covering a pandemic, and we've documented some of the shortcomings in their reporting. Now we're turning to journalists with some actual credentials in this field, science and health reporters. In many cases, they were the first to recognize the dangers of the outbreak in Wuhan, leaving the rest of us to play catch up. Historically underappreciated and usually underrepresented in newsrooms, science and health reporters now find that their expertise is in demand. But their rise to prominence has been accompanied by a new level of scrutiny in the kind of work that they do, and their critics are coming out of the woodwork. The Listening Post's Flo Phillips now on science journalism, the highs and the lows, in the age of COVID-19. 4.20 p.m., December 31st, 2019. Hopefully this is nothing out of the ordinary, but an at ProMed mail posting about unexplained pneumonias in China is giving me hashtag SARS flashbacks. Boston, USA. In the last few hours of 2019, Helen Branswell, senior infectious disease reporter for Stat News, 
started tweeting about the reports coming out of Wuhan. It was something I definitely thought we needed to be watching. This was something that was setting off alarm bells. 12.31 a.m. January 15th, 2020. Here's where we are on the SARS-like virus found in China. Still many, many questions. Two weeks later, in Berlin, Kai Kupferschmidt, a molecular biomedicine expert and correspondent for Science magazine, joined the discussion about the still undefined virus. It was really becoming clear that the pandemic was just not going to be stopped. It was clear to everyone what was about to happen. 11.35 a.m. January 29, 2020. Modi government's science denialism will get us all killed long before fascism gets a chance. Hashtag coronavirus pandemic. By the end of January, health and science journalist Vidya Krishnan was trying to get the word out in India despite facing significant political challenges. Because the entire political machinery was only focused on uh, the Hindu-Muslim riots in the country, no one paid attention to this pandemic, which was inching closer every day. Three science journalists from three different countries, all sounding the alarm on the virus that would come to be known as COVID-19, well before the rest of the world realized what was coming. Their readership and online followings have skyrocketed as they've taught you terms like flattening the curve. They've schooled you on the importance of lockdowns and mass testing. They've documented the failings of governments to act when the data was there for all to see. And they know how to deal with scientists. In early February, Helen Branswell challenged Dr. Anthony Fauci who many consider to be the voice of reason on the Trump administration's coronavirus task force. At present, given everything that's going on, the risk is really relatively low. Explain to me why the risk is low, somebody, because to me, when I look at this, this virus spreading, it's spreading very e efficiently. Sure. And I can't see why, like, there's no force field around China. Right. It's not going right. to stop there. Again, again. Helen, you seem pretty frustrated in that forum. Why was that? You know, I had been hearing for several weeks authorities in the US and other countries outside of China saying that they thought that the risk outside of China was low. And it made zero sense to me because the virus was spreading really effectively from person to person in China. So when Dr. Fauci said that he thought the risk was quite low for the United States at that point, I pushed back because it made no sense. He did say, you know, could this become a pandemic? Absolutely. But it felt like they didn't want to alarm people. At that point, it wasn't coming. It was already, you know, spreading in the United States. It just hadn't been recognized. Kai, your work has also proven to be prescient. An article you wrote back in 2013 included a quote about a bat in China carrying a potential pandemic. This was Peter Daszak, a, a researcher that I had talked to, that quote comes from him. So I was just doing my job as a reporter, reporting his views. So, you know, if anything, he predicted it. Again and again in the, in the last 10 years or so, when I was doing my reporting, this, this sentence came up from scientists where they were telling me, you know, it's not a question of if there will be a, a big pandemic, the question is when. Scientists like Peter Daszak are crucial for reporters like Kupfer Schmidt, because like most areas of reporting, science journalism starts with the sources. And there are two sources that many science journalists have in common. The first is called ProMed. It's the place where both Branswell and Kupfer Schmidt first heard about an outbreak in Wuhan. It's an online portal where infectious disease experts share and discuss information on unusual health events. It's not designed for journalists, but has become invaluable for many health reporters who have the background to understand the significance of what's on there. The second source these journalists have in common is what they call pre-print servers. They're a kind of testing ground for academics, a place where they share their research online before it gets peer-reviewed and published. In normal times, a lot of scientists hold that research back, play it safe until they're sure of their work. But COVID-19 has changed things. 
scientists are flooding the servers with information they hope will help curb the virus, maybe even cure it. And some of that material is making it into the headlines. When that happens, and potentially invaluable but often unverified information reaches the public, it can easily end up being misconstrued by both the press and politicians. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that too. Sounds interesting. One of the things that I found tragic about uh, this pandemic and the coverage of the pandemic is how politicized the whole thing has become. Which side of the divide people fall on relates to which party they support. There's a deep misunderstanding of what's going on in certain parts of the country. We have a right-wing anti-science government which has been pushing out traditional remedies and it has been asking uh, our population to rely on Ayurveda or homeopathy or yoga or Greek medicine to boost your immunity. Apni immunity badhane ke liye Ayush Mantralay dwara jo nirdesh diye gaye hai उसका अगर हम पालन करें गर्म पानी है काढ़ा है इनका निरंतर सेवन करें दे वांट द रिपोर्टिंग टू बी इन लाइन विद द पॉलिटिक्स सो दैट इट डजंट मेक इंडिया लुक बैड द मिनट द स्टोरी गोस ऑनलाइन वी हैव गवर्नमेंट हैंडल्स एंड पॉलिटिशियंस अटैकिंग इंडिविजुअल रिपोर्टर्स एंड क्वेश्चनिंग आवर इंटीग्रिटी एंड डिसमिसिंग द स्टोरी without actually pointing out what's wrong factually that's been put out one of the reasons the politics tends to trump the science is because that's the way the politicians want it reflected in the officials they make available at their briefings where scientific experts are usually outnumbered by politicos reflected also in the press corps covering them a shortage of reporters trained in the science of the story. I'm not sure that science journalists need to take the lead, but I certainly think they should be, you know, at the table. And I think that is something that also bothers me when I see the press conferences. There are a lot of important questions that science journalists know to ask, that political journalists don't know to ask. Do you have a message for people in Georgia who are soon going to have a choice about going to the hair salon or the nail salon or getting that tattoo? Retail businesses need a bit of time, shops need a bit of time to prepare to open. Are they opening on June the 1st? Ich würde interessieren, für welchen Zeithorizont diese Planungen gelten. Hat das Auswirkungen auf politische Gipfel bei der EU-Ratspräsidentschaft oder aber uh, in Bayern auf die Wiesen? It just seems like these press conferences would really profit if there were also science journalists there. We are reporting with our hands tied behind our back. We don't have access to information. And our scientists do not, are not free to express their opinions. We have a daily media briefing, which uh, at this point does not have a single scientist briefing us and does not have a single science journalist in the audience. We have bureaucrats and uh, bureaucrats uh, don't know what they're talking about. And the political journalists don't know uh, they are asking the wrong questions. Another way to put it, rather than dispatching medical specialists to diagnose the biggest story of our time, to surgically dissect political narratives on COVID-19, most news organisations are sending in the equivalent of family doctors, the general practitioners of journalism. That's hardly the best use of available resources when the story you're covering is a pandemic. And finally, the fact that scientists are predicting that this virus could be with us forever has not stopped people from daring to dream of a post-pandemic world. Thomas Roberts is one of them. He's a poet from London who tried to imagine how this story would be told to future generations. In the following video set, in the years to come, Roberts reads a rhyming bedtime story, the kind that needs a happy ending. And in his poem, which he calls The Great Realization, Roberts manages to come up with one. We'll see you next time, here at The Listening Post. It was a world of waste and wonder, of poverty and plenty, back before we understood why hindsight's twenty twenty. You see, the people came up with companies to trade across all lands, but they swelled and got much bigger than we ever could have planned. 
We'd always had our wants, but now it got so quick. You could have anything you dreamed of in a day and with a click. We noticed families had stopped talking. That's not to say they never spoke, but the meaning must have melted and the work-life balance broke. But then in 2020, a new virus came our way. The governments reacted and told us all to hide away. But while we all were hidden amidst the fear and all the while, the people dusted off their instincts. They remembered how to smile. They started clapping to say thank you and calling up their mums. And while the car keys gathered dust, they would look forward to their runs. And with the skies less full of voyagers, the earth began to breathe and the beaches bore new wildlife that scuttled off into the seas. And so when we found the cure, and were allowed to go outside, we all preferred the world we found to the one we'd left behind. But why did it take a virus to bring the people back together? Well, sometimes you've got to get sick, my boy, before you start feeling better. 